This is Dr. Timnit Gabriel, formerly an AI ethics researcher at Google. In this video, we will discuss her contentious departure from Google, as well as the paper she co-authored that culminated in the conclusion of her employment. Dr. Gabriel's research was focused on the ethical issues and implications of modern use of AI, especially around issues of diversity. For example, Dr. Gabru co-authored a paper describing how the accuracy of facial recognition software depended, in part, on the race and gender of the subject. A write-up in the New York Times said of Gabru's research that while white men were accurately identified 99% of the time, black women were accurately identified only about 65% of the time. When such recognition systems are used by the police and they are so inaccurate for certain groups, one can easily understand the ethical implications in play. At Google, Dr. Gabru was most recently looking into the ethical implications of language models, specifically GPT-2 and 3 from OpenAI and BERT from Google. Language models, in this context, are computer programs that process, predict, and, in a very loose sense of the word, help a computer understand human language. Google uses their BERT language model, in particular, as of 2019, according to Google's product update blog, to help improve search results. In this blog, they write, quote, By applying BERT models to both ranking and featured snippets in search, we are able to do a much better job helping you find useful information. In fact, when it comes to ranking results, BERT will help the search better understand 1 in 10 searches in the U.S. in English, and will bring this to more languages and locales over time, end quote. BERT is especially useful in handling conversational search queries. Dr. Gabriel and her co-authors intended to publish a paper describing their findings regarding ethics and language models, particularly as language models relate to the environment and to the perpetuation of racist, sexist, and generally biased language. Google, however, rejected the paper they intended to share. Jeff Dean, head of Google Brain, the division of the company where Dr. Gabru worked, wrote publicly about why this paper was rejected, saying, quote, A cross-functional team then reviewed the paper as part of our regular process, and the authors were informed that it did not meet our bar for publication and were given feedback about why. It ignored too much relevant research. For example, it talked about the environmental impact of large models, but disregarded subsequent research showing much greater efficiencies. Similarly, it raised concerns about bias in language models, but didn't take into account recent research to mitigate these issues. End quote. Dr. Gabru insisted that the paper be published, and also offered an ultimatum to Google asking them that specific feedback for her paper be provided along with the names of the individuals giving the feedback, and if it was not provided, then she said she would resign. Jeff Dean characterized Google's position as, quote, accepting Dr. Gabru's resignation, end quote, although Dr. Gabru herself views it as a termination because she intended to settle on a resignation date with Google and not resign immediately. There's a lot of controversy about whether Google was right to fire Dr. Gabru in this manner. Dr. Gabru also sent an email to a mailing list at Google saying, quote, stop writing your documents about diversity because it doesn't make a difference, end quote. Dr. Gabru also complained about all of the micro and macro aggressions she had suffered along with her paper being rejected. As of December 7, 2,000 Google employees signed a petition of protest condemning Dr. Gabru's firing. The petition reads, in part, quote, Dr. Gabru is a path-breaking scientist doing some of the most important work to ensure just and accountable AI and to create a welcoming and diverse AI research field. And instead of being embraced by Google as an exceptionally talented and prolific contributor, Dr. Gabru has faced defensiveness, racism, gaslighting, research censorship, and now a retaliatory 
military firing, end quote. And also this, quote, the termination is an act of retaliation against Dr. Gabriel, and it heralds danger for people working for ethical and just AI, especially black people and people of color, across Google, end quote. From the outside, it may not really be possible to tell who was right or wrong, but what we can do is look at Dr. Gabriel's paper with a critical eye and ask, does it make sense to pull this paper? If it is a great paper, then Google is just punishing Dr. Gabriel as the petitioning employees claim. If it is a terrible paper, then perhaps Google was right to want it pulled. An article in MIT Technology Review said that they, quote, obtained a copy of the research paper from one of the co-authors, Emily Bender, a professor of computational linguistics at the University of Washington. Though Bender asked us not to publish the paper itself because the authors did not want such an early draft circulating online, end quote. That by itself is something of a warning warning flag. If Dr. Gabru was already pushing for submitting the paper at a conference, why does her co-author feel that the paper is not ready to be shared? Regardless, Reddit user Timnit Lover leaked a full text of the paper online, which is still in a draft state. We can take a look at that paper now. Dr. Gabru and co-authors identify four main ethical risks from current use of language models. First, risk to the environment. Second, perpetuation of hegemonic language. Third, that the models will be used to exploit people. And fourth, that the opportunity cost of investing in these models will lead people from better research opportunities. The first and fourth arguments are obvious nonsense. Let me explain. Of the environment, Gabru writes, quote, While the average human is responsible for an estimated 11,023 CO2 pounds emitted per year, training the transformer big model with neural architecture search emits an estimated 626,155 pounds of CO2. The authors also estimate that training the BERT model, the BERT base model on GPUs requires as much energy as a trans-American flight after taking into account the number of experiments required to train a state-of-the-art model, including hyperparameter tuning, end quote. Worldwide, there are hundreds of thousands of flights per day. If we accept the estimates in this paper, and I couldn't find them by looking in the cited papers, then Google's one additional flight worth of CO2 is still a minuscule, negligible contribution to global warming. What we get in a exchange for the energy use is improved Google search, and that is used by billions of people across the world every day. In addition to this being a negligible contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, Google is mostly green when it comes to energy. On the Google Data Center blog, they write, quote, for the third year in a row, Google purchased enough renewable energy to match 100% of our annual electricity consumption, end quote. In other words, they purchase 100% of their energy usage in green energy, but sometimes, as of the writing in the Google blog, they are still buying non-green energy when they need it. They'll just buy additional green energy to compensate. So again, even if this relatively small, relatively on an industrial scale, energy usage were a problem, Google has already gone above and beyond to mitigate the problem by using green energy sources. Dr. Gabru doesn't mention this fact in her paper at all. Perhaps Dr. Gabru would say that the language models keep getting bigger all the time, and while our current models aren't a real problem, the future models may be. I agree that trend is possible, perhaps even likely, but we are a long way off from that becoming a reality. This concern is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. Perhaps future language models will be a problem in terms of emissions, but current language models clearly are not. Dr. Gabru's fourth argument is about the opportunity cost. She writes correctly that language models don't actually understand the language they are producing or consuming. Quote, a language model is a system for haphazardly stitching together sequences of linguistic forms it has observed in its vast training data according to probabilistic information about how they combine, but without any reference to meaning, a stochastic parrot. End quote. Dr. Gabru goes on to argue that researchers and laymen alike may be misled, believing that they are making progress on getting AI to understand language, while actually doing nothing more than building a better and trickier stochastic parrot. This is Dr. Gabru's opportunity cost, that researchers waste time following a path that ultimately leads nowhere. Quote, from the perspective of work on language technology, it is far from clear that all of the effort being put into using large language models to beat 
tasks designed to test natural language understanding, and all of the effort to create new such tasks, once the existing ones have been bulldozed by the language models, brings us any closer to long-term goals of general language understanding systems. If a large language model, endowed with hundreds of billions of parameters and trained on a very large data set, can manipulate linguistic form well enough to cheat its way through tests, meant to require language understanding, have we learned anything of value about how to build machine language understanding, or have we been led down the garden path? End quote. There are two problems with this. First, many researchers don't share Dr. Gabru's opinion that language models are not worth pursuing. Why should we listen to Dr. Gabru say that these methods aren't worthwhile when the researchers who are pursuing them keep producing results? Second, Dr. Gabru has assumed a single specific goal, namely building machine learning, uh, excuse me, namely building machine language understanding. Language models may or may not contribute towards this goal, but that is also not the only goal that there is, nor is it the stated goal of the organizations Dr. Gabru is criticizing. Google, for example, may find it valuable to invest in language models, even if language models would never produce true machine understanding. As we saw before, the language model BERT improves 10% of all Google searches. Surely that is a valuable outcome on its own, even though BERT doesn't really understand anything. If Dr. Gabru had an alternative to language models that would develop true machine understanding, she could develop that alternative and demonstrate it to other researchers. I'm sure more researchers would come flocking once they saw the results. However, if there is no such, if there is no such alternative, why be so dismissive of language models as a research avenue? Dr. Gabru's second and third arguments, I believe, are more substantial. The second argument is that language models will encode hegemonic language, meaning the language that is dominant in the language model's training data will structure what the language model produces. If you train your language model on data that is sexist, racist, biased in some way, then your language model is likely to subtly encode those preferences. The results of this may be obvious. For example, your language model might produce offensive language, or the results may be subtle. Your language model may develop an implicit bias that women are not supposed to be doctors, for example. Quote, we foresee that the language models producing text will reproduce and even amplify the biases in their input. Thus, the risk is that people disseminate text generated by language models. End quote. Dr. Gabru also points out that language models are typically trained on vast sets of data, more text than anyone could reveal. Because nobody has reviewed the text, there has not even been a cursory effort to make sure that hegemonic language has not been included. Dr. Gabru's third argument is that language models that produce text could be used for malicious purposes. Dr. Gabru suggests a conspiracy theorist using a language model to create the illusion that there were already many adherents of the conspiracy theory, and that might induce more people into believing the theory, because so many already apparently do. You can easily extend the same idea to things like scammers. You could have a language model creating custom scams for millions of people, or use it for cults or fake news. While I believe some of Dr. Gabru's concerns are valid, I disagree with her proposed solutions. Dr. Gabru suggests three main solutions. First, using smaller language models. This would save on electricity and mean that you could use small enough data sets that people could review them to rule out hegemonic language. Second, and related, is having people review the training data so you can make sure that you aren't training your language models with problematic text. I disagree with this proposed solution because it basically breaks language models as we know them. The whole reason state-of-the-art language models are so good is because they have so many parameters and so much training data. If we restrict that to the extent that humans can read and review all of the training data, then we will have ruined language models. This would be like a car ethicist recommending cars be made safer by removing the wheels. It very well might prevent accidents, but the car won't work all that well. Finally, Dr. Gabru suggests a solution to the problem of malicious people using language models, writing, quote, Could language models be built in such a way that synthetic text generated with them would be watermarked and thus detectable? Are there policy approaches that could effectively regulate their use? 
End quote. The answer to both of these questions is, of course, no. You can't really watermark text in a way that is easy to detect because text is easily manipulable. If there were a visible watermark, a malicious actor could just automatically remove it. If the watermark were subtle, for example, some statistical pattern in the produced characters, then it wouldn't really help the people getting fooled by conspiracy theorists and scammers, as people informed enough and careful enough to find the watermark would likely not be fooled by the conspiracy or scam in the first place. Finally, if malicious actors had access to the model, they could retrain or fine-tune it to stop producing the watermark. This would add the complication that any malicious actor who could defeat the watermark would gain added credibility. Their text must be real because it isn't watermark. Regulations may have some benefit, but malicious actors are not typically bound by regulations. These solutions are like if I were a gun ethicist faced by the problem of bad people shooting good, and my proposed solutions were, can you just invent a gun that doesn't shoot good guys? or maybe some regulation to only shoot good guys. Those are fine ideas, but they aren't very substantive, and they don't solve the problem. You may observe that we do have regulations not to shoot good people, but we also have regulations not to defraud people already. Okay, so now I've finally reached the end, and I can sum up everything and reflect on the controversy. What do I think really happened with this case? In my opinion, Google probably did not like seeing negative things about technology that they are using and developing. Google doesn't want its researchers writing about how Google is racist, bad for the environment, perpetuating hegemonic language, etc. My reading of Jeff Dean's email is that he asked Dr. Gabru to rephrase her paper so that Google came out looking better, along the lines of, language models are racist, but here's what Google is doing to fix it. Or, language models use a lot of electricity, which is why it's so good that Google is using green energy. I assume Google also did not like the advice to stop trying to produce bigger and better language models. Obviously, Google is not going to follow that advice when there are competitive and business advantages to producing bigger and better language models. When Dr. Gabru didn't change the paper to Google's satisfaction, Google had the paper pulled. Dr. Gabru protested and was, quote, allowed to resign, end quote, or fired, however you prefer to say it. I do think that Dr. Gabru's firing was deserved. Why, after all, would Google pay an AI ethicist to tell them that they are unethical and give them solutions that they are obviously not going to do? For what it's worth, if I were a Google AI ethicist, and Google, if you're listening, I know you now have an opening and I'm willing to join, I would suggest solving the problem of harmful language in the dataset by training a language model and then fine-tuning it to recognize problematic language, and then using the fine-tuned language model to go back over the input data and filter out any problematic data. Then you could train a new model on your cleaned up data set and produce something that was much less problematic data. Uh, excuse me, that was a, le a much less problematic language model, even if it was still not perfect. Anyway, that will do for my review of Dr. Gabru's paper and her termination. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by clicking the like button. If you'd like to see more content in a similar style, you can go ahead and subscribe. Thanks for your time.